March attack had failed. The April attack had failed. By May the 1st, 1918, Germany's situation was already becoming dangerous. Hindenburg and Ludendorff had thrown the whole available strength of the German army against the British. Everything that Germany possessed had been flung in. The British had lost 240,000 men in 40 days. The French, coming to their aid, had lost over 100,000. But the Germans themselves had lost nearly 350,000 men. Germany's failure went deeper than the great loss of men, tragic as this was for her war-weary people and soldiers. She had also lost the 40 days, and time was more precious to her now than ever before. Field Marshal Hindenburg expressed the German problem. We had a new enemy, economically the most powerful in the world, an enemy possessing everything required for the hostile operations reviving the hopes of all our foes and saving them from collapse while preparing mighty forces. It was the United States of America and her advent was perilously near. Would she appear in time to snatch the victor's laurels from our brows? That and that only was the decisive question. Nearly 13 months had passed since America had entered the war. During those months, her allies had each endured their severest ordeals. Russia had fallen. France had sunk to her lowest depths of weariness. Italy had trembled on the edge of catastrophe. Britain had faced defeat by starvation at the hands of the U-boats. Yet in their darkest hours, the Allies had drawn hope from one thought. The Americans would be coming. Someday, sooner or later. As the weeks turned into months, and the months completed a year, the sour truth emerged that it would be later. Despite her vast resources, America's unpreparedness for war exceeded that of any other country. The British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, commented, The record of Britain's first ten months of blundering in the matter of equipment robs us of the right to point the finger of scorn at America's effort. But it must be remembered that when America entered into the struggle, her industry was already largely organized for war by the immense Allied orders for war material of every kind. Delay followed delay. Delay in production, delay in organization, delay even in clothing America's new army, all adding up to the worst delay of all, the delay in arriving on the field of battle. As the British awaited the first great German onslaught in March, the historian F.S. Oliver remarked, it's a question of holding out until the Americans come in. Until the Americans come in? God damn them, are they ever coming in with all their boastful, vainglorious talk? The March battles were fought without benefit of American support. So were the battles of April. Now it was May. On the 2nd, Oliver was asking, When is it reasonable to think that the Americans will be able to put in that immense army of three millions, fully equipped? each man with a hair mattress, a hot water bottle, a gramophone and a medicine chest, which they tell us will get to Berlin and cook the goose of the Kaiser. When? If it came next year, it might produce the desired military results, but is there the slightest reason to imagine that it will come next year, or the year after, or even the year after that? From a purely military point of view, I don't see victory approaching. American energy was enormous. American enthusiasm for the war was undoubted. All the ebullience of a youthful nation poured into this effort.
On May the 1st, 1918, there were only 400,000 Americans in France. There was only one American division on an active front, only four divisions in the line altogether. Sickening for the Allies, the frustrations of the long wait were sickening for Americans too. American soldiers arriving in France were disgusted to find that they depended on their allies for even the simplest munitions of war. The British supplied helmets, clothing, transport, heavy artillery, tanks. The French supplied the vast numbers of field guns needed, aircraft, even machine guns. A shipment of machine guns finally arrived. And when we opened them, we almost had a revolution. We found, we received Hotchkiss guns, Hotchkiss machine guns. That was the guns the French army used. Well, there was a big commotion. The officers got in touch with the headquarters and headquarters with the Supreme Headquarters and back and forth, back and forth, but nothing happened. Next morning, the officer came in and said, man, I'm sorry, that's it. Those are your weapons and that's what you will have to eat use up front. You better learn how to operate them. Too sweet. Training, drilling, marching, practicing, more training, still more training. French instructors, British instructors, whatever else they were, the Americans were not idle. So uh, we were trained, and we were trained right down to the bone. We awaited the call. We were no uh, jingos, or we were no uh, uh, screamers around for this or that, but we were trained for war. That was our profession, the regular Marines. And uh, uh, we didn't like the waiting behind the line. We practically broke open a bottle of champagne when the word came that we were to move the uh, next 48 hours. Somewhere, we didn't care where. Uh, we'd had enough of this uh, business of play acting. Uh, we wanted to get somewhere where we could do some damage and uh, get done, get back home. The first weeks of May passed quietly on the Western Front, but it was a spurious calm. While the Americans completed their training and organization and absorbed over 200,000 newcomers in France, the Allies licked their wounds. Every British division was below strength. 10 out of 40 were so weakened that they were described as exhausted and scheduled to be broken up. Reinforcements consisted mostly of boys of 18 and a half or wounded men returning to the ranks. Old soldiers found it an ugly task to prepare boys fresh from school or apprenticeship for the hardest battlefields ever known. When they came to us, they were weedy, sallow, skinny, frightened children, refuse of our industrial system as it was in those days. And they were in very poor condition because of wartime shortages of food. But after six months of good food, fresh air, and physical exercise, they changed so that their mothers wouldn't have recognized them. We weighed and measured them, and they put on an average of one stone in weight and one inch in height. Frenchmen found it difficult to sympathize with British manpower problems. France herself had sacrificed steadily throughout the war the best of her manhood. By April 1918, she was already calling on the conscripts of 1919 to avoid breaking up divisions. 